So, not only did I not get the opening shot I wanted, although a cat is fine too, but I have completed fewer games this year than I have in any previous year. Although, normally by one. In case you're wondering, my opening shot was going to be this inflatable snowman in Santa that a local hotel puts up. But it's always so windy, they're just swaying around like they're completely steaming, it's fantastic. Anyway, I think the fewer games thing might be down to the fact that I've reviewed more games that I've played in previous years, rather than playing them for the purposes of review. Which, for the purposes of this video, actually works, rather than just say, I played Game X, I reviewed it, I have nothing to say. It's not so entertaining. I don't want to do that. I want to be able to put this in and then add something that I didn't fit into the review or thoughts that I've had afterwards. I could talk about playing Mass Effect from start to finish with important characters, although I've already talked about Mass Effect 3 in my Games 2012 video, but let's face it, I'm not going to put anybody through that. One thing I will say, it was quite a variety this year. I'm, I'm proud of myself. It was a nice change. Okay, let's just get into it. There are many words I want to say from my face hole. Go! Number one, Yakuza 2! So here's a little hint at how embarrassing I am at finishing games. To complete this game, from watching the intro to beating the final boss, took me around five years. Now that's not constant. Basically, I started playing it, put it down, came back to it years later. Still a bit embarrassing, but not as embarrassing as trying for those full five years. And then I had to look up the plot to understand what the hell I was doing. Anyway, the game itself. Although you do notice the shorter load times in between scenes, like transitioning from one part of a street to another, that's good, like that. But the thing is, I went into this series because I'd heard it was a bit like Shenmue. I like Shenmue. This series is a bit like Shenmue. So, yeah, smiles all round. And so the second game does more of the same, except for the bits that it doesn't. Example, the added environmental heat attack. Get your heat meter all the way up, grab your opponent, stand next to one of these things like a wall or a railing or something, and basically throw your opponent into a pelvis first. That said, there's points in the story where the game decides to go a bit mental. I'm not willing to put this down to lol Japanese, but just hear me out. I found myself a wee side quest by bumping into some bouncers. A quick chat, an even quicker fight, and an equally quick chat with the boss, I'm invited upstairs. And it starts off looking like it'll be a massage parlour with the biggest bunny ears I can put on. Until I can't remember exactly what happens, I think a wall falls down or something, and you see a room full of grown men in nappies. In case you're of a North American persuasion, nappies is our word for diapers. I think it's used in England as well. I don't mean the belts that sumo wrestlers wear, okay? I'm talking honest to god, stop a baby trailing poop everywhere in nappies. You're even invited to join them! No. Which the boss takes as an insult, and then you're fighting an entire room of grown men wearing the nappies. I can barely get that sentence out, quite frankly. I did enjoy it though. It's got exploring, it's got fighting, it's a bit like Shenmue. And it does it, again, more of the same, with some improvements. So, yeah, you like the first one, second one, yay. I'm really looking forward to getting balls deep into Yakuza 3 though. I mean, the PS2 is really starting to show its age by the time Yakuza 2 came out. And I played the demo for Yakuza 3. So yeah, keep an eye out for that in... Well, by the look of things, 2020. Number two, GTA V. Definitely better than four, given that I actually managed to complete this one. Also, it's interesting that two GTA games have bank heist missions, which are arguably better than the entirety of Kane and Lynch. I mean, the heist missions in GTA V are definitely worth a mention. GTA IV, it was just a mission. GTA V, there's a bunch of ones like this. And you go into some extra planning about which route you're going to take, what tactic you're going to use, and which people you're going to bring along. If you bring along the same people, there's the named characters that you see and some uh, random looks as well. And whoever you take on will improve whatever their role was in that heist. So you can bring them in on later ones and they'll be improved. Good stuff. They'll cost more, but they will be improved. Weirdly, the most fun I had, apart from one incident with a minigun, any more than that is a spoiler, is a very simple action. I would jump on people. It sounds daft and that's only because it completely and utterly is. You jump, you collide, and then the glory of ragdoll physics and the Euphoria engine kicks in. If you don't know, Euphoria allows a character's limbs to move around without an animator actually being involved. Uh, procedural animation, I believe it's called. You'll see it most clearly when a character has to get up off the ground or is hit by a car and let me slam their hands on the dash. That silly thing gave me so much joy because I just thought it was so funny. Not so much fun for the people watching me play, however. Also, they didn't like it when I beat that flying mission on one try that they've been stuck on for an hour. 
Yeah, they were expecting something more along the lines of blow up a car and then hold off the police as long as possible. Or my particular favourite, they wanted me to steal a helicopter during a situation. I'm not even sure that's possible. Just go to the hospital. There's one there as long as you're not being chased by cops. So apart from that, three characters actually brings a lot to the game. If nothing else, because if you get hopelessly lost in one character, just switch to another one. And in the case of Franklin, embarrassing dialogue from pretty much every black character. So it's a GTA game. If you like GTA games, you'll like this one. If you thought GTA 4 was a letdown, GTA 5 is better. There you go. Number 3, Bioshock Infinite. This game got a weird, weird reception. Back when it came out, it was pretty good scores all across the board. Some people didn't like it, they were only a minority. Then somewhere in the region of 6 to 12 months later, people started turning on it for various reasons. And I'm one of those heretics who doesn't actually mind Bioshock 2. Certainly not to the extent that some people rally with pitchforks against it. Ruin the franchise? Really? But that game also had the same syndrome I found with Knights of the Old Republic 2. Gameplay improvements that I wish had been in the first one. But I'm getting sidetracked. I've never been a fan of the shooting mechanics in Bioshock. Something about it always felt a bit imprecise and slippery. But I put that aside for two games already, so that really wasn't much of an issue. What was a big issue is it ran like shit on my laptop. It didn't help that I started playing it on a summer where it was too hot to sit inside. But that laptop died and a new one took its place, and that ran it acceptably. I couldn't run it with SSAO on, but that's generally one of those settings I can get away with not having. I noticed that the least out of pretty much everything. Now, I'll admit, I got into Bioshock on basis it was a bit like System Shock 2. Seeing a pattern here. Scaled way the hell down, but a bit like it nonetheless. Infinite doesn't have that same feel to it. I mean, you might only be able to escape with a thousand foot drop, but it's still out and open. And it's pretty hard to feel confined when you're zooming about the place with your hand attached to a tram line. It's also bloody hard to hit anything when you're zooming around attached to a tram line. Now, one thing that did struck me is how violent the game seemed. And I'm not talking about the thousands of people you gun down or swarm with bees. It's how the violence itself is presented. When I performed my first melee kill, I was actually taken aback at how gory it was. Now, I don't believe Infinite is violent for the sake of it. But even with the horrific violence juxtaposed with the idealised look of the environment, I still think it was a bit much. Okay, new topic. A lot has been said about how Elizabeth is not your typical damsel in distress escort character. I'm not sure I completely agree, she doesn't act like a damsel in distress, sure, but apart from that, it's she finds you items and she has her invincibility flag turned on. Granted, she's essential for keeping the story going, but it's not as if you have to work to keep her alive. Do get some decent conversations out of her, rather than just having the usual stay here, run, hide, do a little dance, etc. And I do like her as a character, but she's not the revolution that some people make her out to be. And then we have the actual story, which is intriguing in its own way, but I found quite hard to follow after a while. Mostly keeping track of what reality I'm in and what's different. I mean, there's no player choice or anything it really affects, but it would have been nice. But yeah, you can definitely say they've made... something. You can tell I don't really script these out, can you? Number four, Blackwell Epiphany. I don't know if I've spent enough time talking about the Blackwell series. Certainly not enough time about how good it is. I will review it one day, but it requires a certain amount of effort, both because it's a series and both because it's really good. I want to get that one right. Not that she wants to be a spirit medium mind, it's kind of thrust upon her. A ghost called Joey shows up one day and boom, this is suddenly her job. That job being to help the souls of the people who have not passed on to the afterlife do so. Uh, either due to some kind of unsolved mystery, trauma, coming to terms with what they've done, etc. You help them realise what's happened, come to terms with it, and then off to the afterlife they go. You'll do a bunch of these per games, some as part of the main story and some as some additional smaller stories. Now, the Blackwell games are serious, but they're well written enough so they can have funny dialogue without detracting from the whole. See the Broken Sword games for another example of this. Like, right now. And it's a two-button interface which pleases me so. Added on to that, you get a notebook to write down clues in, ask people about those clues, and even combine clues to find connections between them. I mean, it's lifted from Discworld Noir verbatim, but even the creator himself admits that. I don't mind people nicking a good gameplay feature if they actually know why it's good. I mean, how many games did you see copying the scum interface just because it was there? Good way to figure out which is good, which is bad? Do they have keyboard shortcuts? If they don't have keyboard shortcuts, they were just copying it for the hell of it. 
And on top of that, you get to control both Rosangela, or Rosa for short, and Joey himself. So Rosa can talk to people, Joey can go through walls, and both of them can talk to ghosts. So they've got their own special abilities in that way. I mean, the most physical presence Joey actually has is blowing on things, which means, well, yeah, you blow on people. It may not be part of the story, but you'll do it. You'll do it at least once, just to fuck with them. Anyway, that nutshells the series up until now without spoiling anything major. Plus, there's like one interface change throughout the entire thing. Rosa gets a smartphone at some point, which saves her going back to her apartment and using her computer all the damn time. So, how does this work as a conclusion to the entire saga? I'm happy with it. I mean, the ending did seem to go a little bit nuts, but I have this habit of getting so invested in characters that I cease to recognise when the format they're in has actually just turned to crap. Don't ask me to judge a story, okay? I can point out bullshit and contradictions, that's about it. One thing I will say is the story definitely got darker, which makes sense as the series, for lack of a better word, matures. It ups the stakes, again, if you've got an ongoing series, the stakes have to rise at some point, certainly more than they were in the previous game. And seeing Rosa and Joy interact here compared to how they reacted to each other in the first game is something I definitely wanted to see. It's pretty clear that Blackwell's a project that was cared for. It was done by people who loved it. Which is helped by the commentaries from the creators that go into each one of these games. It's usually writer-programmer David Gilbert and artist Ben Chandler. Sadly, only individually though, I would have loved to get them together to talk about this. So I'm happy to say that this is a good way to end the series, and I'm glad they didn't decide to milk it any further just for the hell of it. He knew it was time to end the series, did Gilbert, and he did. Even though I did I. If nothing else, it led me to find you a list on Wikipedia of games with commentaries. Yes, most of them are made by Valve. Number 5, Dishonoured. I'm frankly surprised this ran on my laptop at all, let alone as well as it did. Probably not a constant 60 frames per second, but certainly never below 30. But before I get into the game, an awkward confession. I've ragged on Harvey Smith for quite a while, not constantly, but ever so often. And this started around about the time of Deus Ex Invisible War. That uh, didn't come out as well as most Deus Ex fans had hoped. Now, this is when Harvey Smith went from designer to project lead and the game got significantly less input from Warren Spector. Then Black Sight Area 51 comes out and proves my suspicions. Harvey Smith should not be put into a leadership role. Now I don't believe that anymore and the turnaround actually happened before Dishonored. Harvey Smith and Warren Spector did a post-mortem of some of their games, back to some of the ones made in the origin days, and this included Deus Ex and Deus Ex Invisible War. Now, the first point I turned around is when Warren Spector described some of the great contributions Harvey Smith made to the original Deus Ex, namely an uh, overhaul of the skill system, followed by Harvey describing all the bad stuff that happened during the making of Invisible War. Which was to say bad team chemistry, bad technology choices, the programmer making a renderer far beyond the means of their target platforms, and they shipped too early. But I think Harvey said it best when he said, we made an 80% rated shooter which was not a worthy successor to the original game. I'm paraphrasing, but I think it hit all the important beats. It's not a horrible game, and I might make a video on that subject in the future. It's really not a horrible game, and I might make a video on that in the future. But it did not live up to its predecessor. That is hard to deny. Though it actually lets you do a no-kill run, whereas the first game did not. Next, I find out a bunch of similar fuckery has gone on with his projects. Executive meddling, as TV tropes would put it. So I ended up sympathising with the guy a lot more and really hoping that he would one day have another great game to attach his name to. Dishonoured is that game. Exploration, emergent gameplay, decent shooting mechanics, RPG elements, let's face it I'm a sucker for those. And not only embracing player choice and having it affect the story, but the environment as well. The more people you kill, the shittier the place looks. Rats and plague victims all over. If I had to come up with a pithy tagline for it, I would have to go with Steampunk Deus Ex. I don't know if the key to the success was giving them other people to work with in this leadership role, but whatever they did, it worked. And as a weird epilogue to all this, when I mentioned I'd completed the game on Twitter, because that's what I do, Harvey Smith himself got in touch with me to say thank you. I didn't add him, I didn't use a hashtag, it just happened. He must have a search set up. Safe to say he's proud of that one, and so he should be. Number 6, Silent Hill 3. And we drift back into the epic saga of Gordon plays a game and his friends laugh at his failures. Okay, that's not fair. I play a game they've already played and we compare experiences. Then again, if it turns out they were trolling me blatantly, I got my revenge by making one of them play Fahrenheit. That game is not as good as I remember. 
that some people say the first half is good, I would not be that generous. I'd say the first third. Also, one of the extras is a character dance party done in engine. And one of the shots is David Cage dancing with Carla, who's in her underwear. I'm just going to leave that with you. Anyway, actual Silent Hill talk. It's not as good as two. Sad to say, but it's true. There's a focus on combat for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. I mean, I've never played a Silent Hill game that needs a certain amount of ammo to progress. In fact, complete opposite. In the first game, one of the bosses could be defeated if you walked in with no ammo. They would just die instantly. Although one thing that has occurred in previous games is the instant death scenario, where you do a thing and you instantly die. Silent Hill 3 has too many of those. The main character in 3, Heather, I found annoying. Mostly it's the whiny teenager stereotype, but it doesn't mean I want to play as that. It makes sense, but it's no less annoying. The game does have its moments, which uh, unfortunately I'll have to turn on the spoiler warning for. You get to the end, we find Claudia in the chapel type place, Vincent's got himself all sorts of dead. Claudia dares Heather to do something to stop the unholy ritual of less than holiness. And then control is returned to the player, and anyone who's played this game already, prepare for a bit of laughter. What do I do? CHARGE! <laughs> Instant game over cutscene! Yeah! Damn near sent my friends to the floor with that one. They were laughing so hard. But you focus a game around combat, what do you think my first reaction's gonna be? Uh, incidentally, the pendant was my second choice. And frankly, the whole thing gave me the excuse to say charge in a silly voice, which um, I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take it every time. And just before I turn off the spoiler warning, I'll mention something about the Shakespeare puzzle. That's, uh, that's a bit of trolling I did. Uh, just before I turn off the spoiler warning, I will mention one thing. I solved the Shakespeare puzzle, the one with the books, the hard way, as I didn't realise there was an easier way to see the markings on the side. One of my friends made fun of me for it, so I decided to mess with his minor OCD tendencies by putting the books in, getting the code, unlocking the door, going back and getting one of the books, and carrying it with me for the rest of the game. Believe me, drove him nuts every time I opened that inventory. It was great. Okay, spoiler warning done. No need it anymore. I'm glad I played it though. Don't know if I'll be saying that once I'm done with Silent Hill 4, but we'll see. Number 7, The Whispered World. I reviewed it already. I have nothing to add. Wait, didn't I say I wasn't gonna say? Number 8, Gone Home. So, I made the same mistake a lot of people did. My dearly befuddled and I were sitting around on Halloween thinking, let's play something scary. Well, scary by normal people's standards. I don't actually get freaked out by anything other than going into the body of the many on System Shock 2. Ugh. I mean, let's be real here. I get hit with jump scares the same as anybody else. Creepiness, not so much. Anyway, it wasn't scary. I don't want to do big spoilers, but I think the cat's out of the bag with that one by now. Functionally, you walk around and you interact with stuff, and sometimes you read. Sometimes you listen. The point behind it is to discover why you've come back and your house is completely abandoned. And in time, it reveals what's been happening whilst you've been away on your gap year or some shit. I've not played many of these so-called walking simulators, so don't call me an authority on the subject, but I suspect that many of them were trying to get by on artsy visuals and vague story elements. Story in Gone Home was interesting for me enough to walk around this place and find out what happened. Well, stories. The dad, mum and sister all get a story each, essentially, but the sister story is the main one. I do like how it was set in 1995 to deliberately avoid that but everybody's got a cell phone type of thing. Plus it makes me feel a bit nostalgic for the era. Although it's less punk rock and hair dye and more can I get this to run on a 486. So for the three or so hours we spent wandering around that place, I'm glad I played it. Number nine, Hotline Miami. I can understand why this made Scott coin the phrase violence puzzles. Because that's exactly what it is. You have to kill people, sure, but you have to do it right. If you're going to run in dong swinging all over the place, you're going to get it shot off. You need to plan, you need to strategize. Which room am I going to take first? Which person am I going to take out first? If I take them out, it alerts everybody else. If I use a gun, it'll alert everybody else. If I go this way, I'll get spotted. If I go this way, I don't get this weapon that I might need for this person. There's a lot to it. And the masks are as good an upgrade slash reward system as any. And they further add to the strategizing you need to do before the level starts. The aesthetic is odd. Neon, blood, trippy dream sequences. Makes it stand out though, you're not going to mistake it for something else. I was mostly focused on gameplay anyway, so I might not have been paying as much attention to that as it could have been. It was enough to keep me going at any rate. If there's one thing I've learned, I'm shit at this type of game. I've never been as comfortable with a mouse as I have been with just a keyboard. 
Although I'd probably have been equally rubbish at this with a gamepad. FPS games I'm fine with, but maybe because I've been doing that since 1993. Something about this top-down perspective messes my aim up, I don't know what it is. There's a lot of missed shots that I didn't feel responsible for, but the game certainly wasn't responsible. So I kind of had to suck it up. I would try out the old, it's fine if it's hard as long as it's fair line. But I've played a little bit of Dark Souls recently. I am now convinced that From Software hates my balls. Anyway, hard as it was, I was able to persevere without saying just complete and utter fuck this out loud. So try this out for shooty fun and brain exercising. It's like judo with guns. That's the dumbest tagline I've ever come up with. Number 10, Alien Isolation. I liked this game, definitely liked it. I just have a bit of trouble articulating why. Of course, I'll have a go anyway. First of all, loved the aesthetic of it. When I saw that 20th Century Fox logo with the shitty VHS effects, I was just like... And again, the game is rated 18 on this shore, so 18 year olds might actually remember VHS. Then again, again, I wonder if VHS effects are just universally recognised now. Even by people who've never used a VHS tape, whether it's just Oh, that's the rewind effect, or oh, that's the fast forward effect. Like if somebody born after 1999 found your floppy disk collection and asked you why you had a collection of save icons. I know, sidetrack, sidetrack, sidetrack. I'm going to need an alarm or something to see when I've gone off topic. The fact that this is not only a good licensed game, but a good licensed alien game, it, it just brings me joy. And it also managed to add a little bit to the series lore without it making no goddamn sense. Cough, aliens, colonial marines, cough. Then pile on the fact that it tries to do something different yet appropriate for the subject matter. Your main antagonist, as all the press gives away, is one alien. It'll stalk you relentlessly and you cannot kill it. At best you can force it to retreat temporarily. I mean, you can try to run. I don't recommend it. But weirdly enough, it does show damage. Like if you blast it a couple times with a shotgun, you get little green splatters on it. Does it die? No. Does it slow down? No. Does it even retreat? There's a big hole in the front of my face that says otherwise. No reason why not, I suppose. I, I just found it odd. That said, there is another type of enemy in the game which is also different in a way. I've never seen a game enemy who just grabs your melee weapon and punches you if you don't take them by surprise. So the rest of the game is you, Amanda Ripley, trying to find the black box from the Nostromo which you've been told is on the space station what you're on. The Nostromo, of course, being the ship from the first Alien film followed swiftly by the goal of trying not to get killed as fuck. They also managed to make a crafting system not look like it was tacked on, like it makes sense for an engineer to be able to build things, and she kind of has to in certain circumstances. You'll just find components as you're wandering around the hallowed halls of the space station, and you can make it into stuff if you wish. Granted, medkit's kind of essential, but apart from that, it just feels like part of the world, something that should be there rather than just there for your convenience. And it feels like part of what your character can do, along with, say, messing with the environment, like the lights or the atmosphere systems to create fog to get yourself a stealthy advantage. I mean, it's great that the place looks like a movie set, but if it acted like a movie set, that would not be as good. I mean, it's great that the place looks like a movie set. The fact that it doesn't act like a movie set is better. And I think the space station deserves special mention because it's kind of a star in itself. It invokes the first film really well. It's beat up, it's broken up, before you even set foot on the place. Hell, before the alien even shows up. At times it makes me think of System Shock 2. Yes, again, it's good. You should get, you play it. Play that game. God damn you. So yeah, it makes me think of System Shock 2, which is neither a bad thing, nor something I say lightly. Odd enough, when I was talking about Bioshock Infinite, I said SSAO was something I usually don't notice. This game, it's noticeable. Turn it on if you can. Anyway, the whole point is you're not welcome in this place. It wants you to know that and it becomes fairly obvious. Yeah, remember when I said I couldn't explain why I like this game? That, that's my attempt. That's what five minutes of me just going... Uh, if I had to narrow it down to one thing, it's the fact that all the keyboards on the computers are clicky. There you go, that's your review. And number 11, Rogue Legacy. Rogue Legacy has made me realise I should play more side-scrolling slashy kill thing games. Should have been obvious to me as a Wonder Boy fan, but there you go. I've heard good things about Shovel Knight, actually. I should try that. Anyway, the difference between this Slashy Man jump game and all the other ones is this. The objective is to enter a castle and find a boss room in each of the four sections. Beat those four, and you get a final boss. Then you win. The interesting part comes that when your character dies, 
you come back as a descendant of that character who died. So a child, a grandchild, something like that. The other fun part is that they all have their own various genetic traits. Traits like being massive as fuck or tiny as fuck or having short-sightedness or irritable bowel syndrome. Yes, really. And some of these will have an effect on the game itself. Examples, insane heroes see monsters that aren't there. You just slash at them and nothing happens, but they don't hurt you. Heroes with dwarfism will be smaller, duh. Colorblind heroes, double duh. It got really weird when I got to the very last boss and I was hearing all of their epic dialogue. My character was dyslexic. So yeah, I think when you're dyslexic, all the text that comes up, the first and last letters are the same. Everything else is jumbled. You can still read it though, oddly enough. Even more oddly, I was playing this originally on my old laptop which ran it like crap. So I'd end up picking heroes less for what their abilities were and more how I judged the effects would run. So like short sighting this and blurring half the screen, no way, that's gonna run like crap. You also get money for equipment and family castle upgrades which translates to hero upgrades. And finally you can collect runes which give you a power of some kind. I'm quite a fan of this type of upgrade because the runes slot into bits of armour. For example if you have two double jump runes you can equip them into different bits of armour and then you can triple jump. That doesn't sound right. I mean I like that a lot better than the typical type of upgrade where something good happens but something gets worse. You can still pick and choose without outright having to think this will make something worse. In that situation, I tend to pick nothing. Okay, so to summarise, it's bloody hard and the music is great. Which it damn well had better be, especially for the first level because you're going to be hearing that a lot. Pretty much no matter how good you are because you have to start in that area. And there we are, you're done, finally. Uh, hopefully I'll play more in the year to come and half of them I won't review and make this whole section go, I have played this already reviewed or something, oh god. Ugh. I mean, I've got enough sleep. Goodbye.